Uh, my name is Adrian Brand. I'm a project leader at Valley Vision. Um, and just want to welcome you all to the Clean Air Partnership Technical Advisory Committee. So this is uh, a meeting that we have twice annually to um, talk about really kind of what might be technical air quality related topics, get some smart folks in the room and learn, learn more about them. Um, and, and the Clean Air Partnership, for those who, who may not be familiar, uh, is a coalition that's actually been around since 1986, a coalition of air quality regulators, business representatives, and environmental advocates uh, focused in the Sacramento region, the six county region in particular, um, uh, focused on advancing clean air policy and investments in our region. Uh, and so carbon farming came up as a, as a topic uh, in some recent conversation because we're starting to see this, this concept uh, be advanced in a lot of local climate action planning um, and really just wanted to, wanted to learn more about what it is. Um, and so we're joined by, by some, some smart folks who we'll hear from soon uh, to help us, help us address the topic. And what I like about the size of this room is that I think we can do a round robin intro <laughs> uh, uh, so we all can get to know each other a little bit better. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on people in the, in the order in which you are on my screen and then please just share your name and your affiliation. Don't, don't go beyond that so that we can, we can make this rather, rather quick. Um, so I'm gonna start with Ralph because he's the first person I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm Ralph Chopper and uh, I'm on the board of uh, Ecos Environmental Council Sacramento and also uh, Breathe California, uh, which was one of those organizations that helped start this Clean Air Partnership. Thank you, Todd. Good uh, morning, everybody. Todd Smith, Sacramento County Planning Director. Thank you, Kate. Kate, you're still muted. There you are. Uh, yeah, sorry, I lost the mute button for a minute. Unmute. Um, I'm Kate Reza. I'm with the Yolo County RCD. I'm a program manager, and that's Resource Conservation District. Thank you. That's one thing we try to do is explain our, our acronyms. Uh, so thanks for leading with that. Uh, Kathy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy, and I'm a new project associate at Valley Vision. I'm supporting Adrian in our clean economy portfolio. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. Chris. Chris Norum. Hi, uh, Chris Norum, North State Building Industry Association. So we're the residential construction industry in the Sacramento region. Grace Kaufman. Hey everyone, uh, Grace Kaufman, project manager at Valley Vision. Happy to be here. Thank you, Jennifer Wood. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wood, soil scientist and soil health specialist at California Association of Resource Conservation Districts. Richard Falcon. Hello everyone, Richard Falcon, lead organizer for United Latinos. Happy to be here with all of you. Richard, Tammy Dreamer. Hi, Tammy Dramer, Executive Director of Organized Sacramento. Tammy, Susan, Susan Hurry. Hi, hi everybody. I'm Susan Hurry, uh, President of ECOS. Hey, Glad to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucinda Wilcox. I'm with the City of Sacramento's Public Works Department. Umberto. Uh, Umberto Izquierdo, Yolo County Agricultural Commissioner. Thank you. Majdi. Hi everyone, Majdi Abu Najem, uh, UC Davis Department of Land, Air and Water Resources. Thank you, Nicholas. Nick Armstrong, Tiger Materials, Environmental Compliance Specialist. Thank you, Renee. Good morning everyone, uh, Renee Toledo, uh, SMUD, Supervisor for Environmental Compliance. Campbell. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, good morning, sorry. Uh, Campbell Ingram, Executive Officer of the Delta Conservancy. Good to see you all today. Thank you, Mark. Mark Loudsenheiser, a division manager with Sacramento Air Quality Management District. Great, Tina Reynolds. Hi, I'm Tina Reynolds. I'm the founder and president of Uptown Studios Marketing Firm. Tina, Daniel. I'm Daniel Harbig. I'm the director of sustainability for Wolf Farming. Cool, thanks. Colleen. Hi everyone, Colleen McCormick. I'm the sustainability lead for SMUD. Thanks, Richard. 
Richard Kravitz. Uh, hello, Richard Kravitz. I'm director at UC Center Sacramento. Thank you, Nicole. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Cuellar. I'm a policy advisor in Mayor Steinberg's office. And next up is former CAP Technical Advisory Committee Chair, Becky Wood. <laughs> Becky Wood, uh, local busy body, body uh, <laughs> just crashing in. Don't sell yourself short, but thanks for joining us. <laughs> Let's go to Eric. Uh, Eric Rivera Montes, uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District in the Environmental Services Group. Thank you. And Dave. Yeah, hi, Dave Tamayo. I'm on the Board of Directors for SMUD. Thank you. Jeffrey. Jeffrey Tardigia. Yes, this is Jeffrey, advocate, listening in today and see what you got new on the horizon. Thank you. Shelly Jang. Hi, I'm Shelly Jang from the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. I'm um, filling in for Rafe Porter today. Shelly. And last but not least, the chair of the Clean Air Partnership, John Lane. Hi, this is John Lane. And uh, sorry, I can't uh, turn my video on. I'm on the road today, but I'm really excited to have this conversation and uh, really appreciate everybody putting their time into it. Thank you so much. So um, I know we have a few folks who just popped in, but um, this, this is a meeting of the Cleaner Air Partnership Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, topic today is carbon farming. And basically what, what we like to do at these CAPTAC meetings is have a bunch of smart folks in the room with us um, who are knowledgeable about carbon farming. Um, so number one, tell us what it is so we know what we're talking about for those of us who aren't super familiar. Uh, and then number two, talk about how it's relevant to the Sacramento region. Um, again, we are starting to see some local climate action plans um, uh, start to, you know, in, in, encompass uh, carbon farming and really just want to get a better understanding of what it is so that we, we know what we're talking about. We know how it, how it might benefit our region's climate goals. Um, so with that, we have a few, a few experts. I'm just going to list, list their names. And again, this is an organic conversation, so hoping that they'll all be able to, to provide some, some expertise. Um, but we're joined by Todd Smith, who is Planning Director of the County of Sacramento. And by the way, congrats on the new role, Todd. Um, Majdi Abu Najam, who is Associate Professor of Soil Biophysics at UC Davis. Uh, of course, we also have Campbell Ingram, who is Executive Officer for the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy. Uh, Humberto Izquierdo, who's the Ag Commissioner for Yolo County, uh, and Kate Reza, Program Manager with the Yolo County RCD. So these are, these are those, those smart folks. And I know there's a lot of other uh, uh, folks in this meeting who, who you know, have thoughts on carbon farming and have some background. But I might actually turn to Todd first um, to give us just a little bit of an overview about kind of what's happening at the SAC County level uh, and why, why carbon farming has been coming up uh, more frequently. Thanks, Adrian, for the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, I personally, I appreciate you calling me an expert. I don't really feel like it, but uh, um, but I can tell you, uh, tell the group, everybody, what uh, is in the county's climate action plan, still in draft form as it relates to carbon farming. Um, I think most of the folks in the region know how important the agricultural lands are to Sacramento County. It's a part of not just the county, but the region. I know Yolo County's got a, a tremendous uh, bounty of ag lands as well. Um, <clears throat> the way that we've um, laid out this measure in, in the county's climate action plan, it speaks to um, uh, various folks at the county working with uh, local landowners, farmers, ranchers, land managers, um, as, as well as resource conservation districts. That'll be a new addition in the next draft. Um, and really what that's about is promoting uh, and increasing carbon sequestration opportunities on ag lands through <clears throat> development of carbon farming plans. And so what that means is, sorry, I'm going to turn my phone off over here so that's not distracting. What that means is uh, really looking at um, changes in practices that are implemented on ag lands like uh, uh, low-till uh, or compost application or um, you know, increasing the soil health 
um, through uh, providing some, <clears throat> excuse me, some resources, some, some educational materials if necessary. We identify a number of uh, potential partners in this program. It could be CDFA, it could be you know, some of their programs, the Healthy Soils Initiative, um, the Alternative Manure Management Program, uh, could be the Strategic Growth Council's Sustainable Ag Lands Conservation Program. Um, just on a side note, I know we've been successful here at the county getting a grant through the South program to actually uh, put a, a conservation easement on some, some major properties in the East County. Um, other partners could include uh, the University of California Ag and Natural Resources uh, Sustainable Ag and Food Systems Program or even the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, there's a number of uh, financial and technical assistance programs that um, could be beneficial in um, implementing uh, carbon farming. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, my voice today is a little bit off, but um, generally that's what's in the cap. Uh, it is a, a pretty um, uh, robust, but we think reasonable assumption as it relates to its uh, greenhouse gas reduction potential, just given the size of and, and scale of the remaining agricultural lands in Sacramento County. Uh, we did do some ground truthing just based on conversations with uh, landowners um, and interested parties uh, in the county as we've gone through the various drafts of the, the climate action plan. Um, but we do think it, it's really important for the, as a way to the county to show um, the importance of ag land, uh, not just for the agricultural landowners and the farmers, but for the region. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute and see if anyone else has anything to say. Well, thanks, Todd, for that overview of, of the SAC County effort. Um, and we'll come back, of course, to, to deeper discussion. But, you know, we're also seeing this work happening in Yolo County. And so we have a couple of folks with us from Yolo. I'd actually like to turn to Humberto to talk a little bit more about how carbon farming is, is, is kind of happening in, in Yolo. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, in YOLO, we're still uh, in the development phases of uh, our climate action plan. I know the county is promoting, um, you know, a, a climate action committee that's working with planning to do something very similar to what, uh, you know, Todd mentioned in, in Sacramento County. Um, <clears throat> I am a big advocate for that, uh, to it to include kind of the intangible things that that uh, sometimes are not uh, thought about, uh, that I clearly has a value, added value to, to the environment more than just food production. And I think carbon sacrificial is one of those things. I think there's still, uh, I mean, I, th there is a more formal attempt to increase carbon sequestration through uh, um, the composting of, of um, material from, from other areas to kind of increase that. Uh, I think the issue is that there is some work that needs to happen to incorporate that uh, composted material into the soil uh, down to a certain depth to be able to get some of that, that carbon sequestration, uh, um, you know, to get a quantifiable amount of carbon sequestration. So I think there's still some, some work to be done that way. I think it's definitely a very uh, worthwhile effort uh, to try to look at that and, and, and really quantify that um, at the county and regional level. Thank you. And, and I'm looking at Kate now. Um, so could you, I, we have yet to sort of get at just a sort of a basic definition of what, what carbon farming is in like one or two sentences. And I'm wondering if Kate, you could do that for us. Um, I, I know I've heard of it as described as basically the same as sustainable ag. Do you think, do you think that's true or is that an oversimplification? Well, um, I would say carbon farming, uh, it, it, it could be a part of sustainable ag. It's it's um, really a whole farm approach to, and, and I'm more or less reading off the Carbon Cycle Institute's webpage that I just posted, but, and it, it's a, an approach to optimizing carbon capture on working landscape. And that's by 
using principles and usually NRCS approved natural, the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service approved practices um, for that are known to increase the amount of carbon capture in the land. Things like mulching, um, grass waterways, uh, hedgerows, alley cropping, prescribed grazing, <clears throat> nutrient management by replacing synthetic um, fertilizers with um, soil amendments, that sort of thing. So it's a whole farm, looking at a whole farm and picking out ways that that farm can, can tweak its operations to be storing more carbon. In, in plant material, um, tree material, or in the soil. And, and uh, staying with you, so how does Yolo County Art Resource Conservation District kind of, you know, how are you guys able to, to do some of this work? Well, the Resource Conservation District has um, is a partner of the Center for Land-Based Learning, and um, the Center for Land-Based Learning recently received early action funds from the county through the Climate Action Committee to implement um, three carbon farm plans and to do workshops and um, outreach to farmers to let farmers know what, what it's all about. Um, also um, typically or historically underserved uh, the farming community. And um, that's, that's our, our um, current thrust. We have one staff member who is training up on, on um, learning how to do carbon farm plans. Uh, um, we also are involved with prescribed grazing out in the Yolo Bypass. Um, and we also, uh, just as a matter of not really with the intent of carbon farming, but um, with the idea of wildlife habitat rehabilitation, um, we have been involved for many, many years with uh, revegetation, right, with uh, native plant restoration and hedgerow um, revegetation or hedgerow implementation on farm edges provides habitat for wildlife, also sequesters carbon, also it can um, filter water. Um, there are a lot of co-benefits with, with carbon farming that um, make just make a, a farming operation more sustainable. So it's, I'm not surprised that you've heard sustainability with carbon farming. There's also the opportunity to increase mar marketing potential with some sort of marketing scheme or marketing um, uh, strategy that's built on advertising products as climate friendly. If they come from farms that are um, certified as with carbon farm plants. You know that on the north coast there is fish friendly farming and I think also somewhat in the Sacramento Valley but that's a label people can put on their products to you know certify themselves that they implement practices that are good for fish. Something similar could be developed for carbon farming. Climate that. beneficial. Yeah, no, that's a great. I really appreciate that. Um, so I want to make sure we we're also able to, to hear from Campbell Ingram, who's, who again is the executive officer with the SAC San Joaquin Delta Conservancy. So how do you all uh, engage with this carbon farming stuff? <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's great to have the opportunity and be a part of the conversation. Uh, I just want to mention quickly that we are running a fish friendly farming certification program here for the Delta, which is uh, starting to we're all close to 10,000 acres into that program, so it's pretty exciting. I, I guess I want to first by just start by expanding the, the definition of carbon farming, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how we engage with it. You know, we're really focused on avoided emissions, um, uh, and and relatively and, and focused on that in a relatively small area of the delta, but an area that has just an outsized contribution to climate uh, and, and carbon emissions on an annual basis. So in the very kind of southwestern edge of Sacramento County, a good bit of Contra Costa County, and a good bit of San Joaquin County, 
you have the deeply subsided area of the delta. And that area is about 20 to 30 feet below sea level. It's between 150 and 200,000 acres of land. That hole in the ground essentially is all carbon that has volatilized into the atmosphere as a result of draining those organic soils and planting agriculture. So it's the, it's, it's the volatilization of carbon uh, through microbial oxidation going directly into the atmosphere. And so we have been looking for economic incentives and ways that we can encourage agricultural interests, changing practices to stop that subsidence and stop that carbon emission. That carbon emission, we often average out at about 10 tons per acre per year of carbon going directly into the atmosphere, or about 2 million tons coming off that 200,000 acres in the Delta annually. So by comparison to just agriculture statewide, it's about a quarter of California's total plant-based agricultural emissions on 17 million acres happening just here in this little patch of land in the deeply subsided Delta. So what we're doing for carbon farming is we've developed a protocol uh, and it's been approved for the American Carbon Registry on the voluntary carbon market. And that allows farmers to change practices. And what essentially what needs to happen out there is you just need to re-wet the land. When you, the, these were wetlands previously. And so if you reapply water and resaturate those soils, you stop that microbial oxidation, you stop the carbon emissions, and you stop the subsidence. The other thing I'll mention too is that subsidence fundamentally threatens California's water supply up and could result in significant interruption in our ability to distribute water across the state. There's a couple things you can do to do this. We, we've been working quite a bit with uh, private and public landowners to look at rice cultivation because simply changing to saturated ground for rice cultivation uh, is rice is a higher value commodity than most of what's grown in this deeply subsided area, plus it stops subsidence in the carbon emissions. The other thing that we encourage is simply allowing lands to come back to what we call managed wetlands behind these levees. So there are places in the Delta where land is, is too wet to farm. The peat layer is getting thin and there's no way to farm it. So you can simply allow that to become a managed wetland. We talk a lot about mosaics uh, where you can have land that's too wet to farm going to a managed wetland surrounded by rice cultivation and in, even surrounded by um, uh, higher value crops on the higher lands against the levees. But essentially what it does is it kind of allows you to dial in a mosaic that stops the subsidence, stops the carbon emissions, and, um, and is economically viable. The protocol I mentioned allows you to quantify the avoided emissions from a baseline, certify carbon credits, and then take them to the voluntary market to get an actual sale revenue stream from the carbon credits that have been certified. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. Um, it's a, we've got lots of pilot projects moving. We've got lots of projects in the hopper getting certified, getting their carbon credits certified. And we're hoping to have a fairly substantial chunk of change in this upcoming budget um, to, to be able to help farmers with the cost of conversion to rice and or conversion to managed wetlands uh, and these mosaics in the Delta. So it's a little different, just, just reiterating, you've got a big hole in the ground that puts a tremendous amount of carbon to the atmosphere and causes the subsidence. We're just trying to rewet the land to stop that carbon emission. There's some carbon sequestration, but you also get some methane production from the wetlands, but the real climate benefit here is avoided carbon emissions of 10 to 15 to 20 tons per acre per year when you re-wet that land. Wow, thank you. And there's, you're, you're, you're spurring some good questions in the chat that we'll get to soon. Um, but wanna, wanna make sure that Majdi has the opportunity to, um, to come into the conversation. And, and Majdi, how does, you, how does UC Davis kind of um, work with, and particularly the soil biophysics department, uh, engage with uh, carbon planning, uh, sorry, carbon farming in the region? All right, hello everyone. And thank you, Adrian, for inviting me for this talk. This is a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I wanted to follow up on, on the current talk by saying that carbon farming has a very uh, elastic and not you know, set in stone definition. So uh, everyone should feel comfortable about adding adding to that. So I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, two extremes or two, two, two different ways of, of those definitions. So if you go to Wikipedia, uh, I mean, carbon farming basically refers to the variety of agricultural methods aimed at sequestering atmospheric carbon uh, 
uh, both into the soil and uh, into crops, whether into the roots, the leaves, wood, or, or any part of the uh, plant uh, system. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at an EU definition, uh, carbon farming would refer to uh, farm management practices that aim at delivering climate mitigation in agriculture. So basically, any, any form of farm management that helps in uh, sequestering, capturing, and storing a greater amount of carbon in, in the soil. Now, if you take those last six, seven words, uh, you can basically ask 10 questions about each one of them. So capturing, what do you mean with capturing? Storage, how long and how deep? Uh, and there are already some concerns about the long-term storage of, uh, of carbon. And with how deep, I mean, uh, with cover crops and some of the other uh, healthy soil uh, uh, initiatives, uh, you look at a good carbon stock in the first two, three, four inches, but is this trickling down to deeper carbon uh, depths? So all those are, are still open-ended questions uh, when it comes to uh, putting a, a, a big definition or, or a concrete definition for uh, carbon farming. Uh, some of the activities that we're we're doing at UC Davis, uh, we have the Working Land Innovation Center where we're testing different soil amendments and different soil uh, managements that uh, help in uh, locking down and sequestering carbon. Uh, I'm working with a group of uh, students and, and scientists uh, or researchers on developing a full life cycle assessment to see uh, what would be the, the the overall net benefit out of uh, some of those uh, alternatives or, or things that we're doing. Uh, agrivoltaics and ecological restoration are two uh, new ways of uh, what I call carbon farming that my, my team uh, is, is collaborating on. Uh, we're looking at land, not soil in here. So if we can work on energy and food co-generation, this will help, particularly when you work with small farmers, uh, this will help uh, create uh, green kilowatt hours created from the solar radiation emitted over the lands, over our working lands. Uh, Long term, this can be a great starting point for our growers to adopt electric tractors. And with that, uh, think about how much avoided emissions can be done uh, for agriculture. I mean, some of the numbers that I have, uh, the, uh, the, the US uh, emitted 79 million metric tons of carbon uh, in 2018, uh, only for uh, emissions uh, on farm energy use. Uh, and as we go into more electric tractors, this, this number can be significantly lowered. Uh, so uh, these are some of the uh, ideas that, that we work on. I think a lot of work also should, should uh, revolve around building circular economies around uh, healthy forests and healthy soils. Uh, you all know how much carbon we lose every year to fires. Uh, and as we develop healthier forests through building circular economies that, that basically integrate the carbon and, and develop a, uh, a, uh, an economic value out of it, all those options can lead into a, uh, a, a long-term capturing of, of our carbon. Thanks for that. Man, there's, there's, this is a, a fascinating topic, clearly. Um, I want to uh, shift over. We have Chris Norum with us from the uh, North State Building Industry Association. So from a builder's perspective, Chris, why would carbon farming be of interest to the BIA? Uh, well, thanks, Adrian. Um, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, yeah, I'm the government affairs person for the building industry. Um, this is actually something that came up in the uh, Sacramento County's climate action plan, and it kind of intrigued me, and I got me into some discussions about this with our air quality management group about how we could potentially use this. I guess the way that it would be of interest to us is that, you know, I have started looking into this because it was in the climate action plan for Sac County. And it's actually, there are programs throughout the country that already are doing this in the Midwest. Um, and from the home builder's point of view is that we're always looking for 
alternatives and options for how we can achieve mitigation um, and be good partners with government in achieving the climate goals that they have and the targets we need to meet. So um, if this would offer a financially viable and effective method for um, home builders to, to buy credits to, to uh, meet their needs, that's something that's of, of real value to us. You know, it appears from the metrics I've seen, there's just enormous upside potential I mean, in terms of, you know, how much money does it cost to achieve greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah. Is ripe for um, continued discussion because we have so much ag land in our region. Um, and there, apparently there's already a program going on that in the Delta that um, Mr. Ingram just described. So that we have the sort of the building blocks of it there. And um, so I think that it's, it's gonna require some real collaboration between industry and the government and, and farmers and landholders to, uh, to pursue this. But I think it's worth um, kind of looking into, um, obviously on a voluntary basis, but it's a real win-win opportunity, I think, for, for those of us uh, you know, who are looking for ways to you know, say, the county says, hey, you can do this you know, 200 unit project, but you're gonna have to meet these greenhouse gas targets. And then we could say, well, I can buy a credit to uh, do carbon farming here in this place, and that will um, that will offset what I'm going to do, and so that's a, a real value to us. So we're looking for you know potentially this as a as a way to do a win-win uh, opportunity with the environmental community and local governments. For that so we we have several questions in the chat that are all really good. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning and want to remind folks if you have questions for some of the smart people in the room, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, and so the first one actually came from Tammy Dreamer with Organized Sacramento, thinking about basically she's asking, does this include large parks? Um, so are there examples uh, of, you know, large parks where they've been able to pilot, you know, carbon farming practices? Anyone familiar with that? May I start? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think parks have a, an exceptional role that they can play. Uh, in many of my ongoing proposals, I try to team with parks to develop a demonstration of technologies on, on, on public and accessible lands. I mean, you want to develop a demonstration site in a place where people come and visit, and uh, parks are the natural immediate land that come to mind to develop those. So. Uh, uh, I mean, I have currently a few proposals uh, that are under review. Each one of them will have at least one park or a park and rec uh, associates or, or collaborators where many of our uh, demonstration sites are built on, on those lands. Thanks for that. Anyone else want to speak to that? Seems like there's certainly a there there. Um, so Richard Kravitz asks, so how much carbon are we talking about? Do, does carbon farming or do carbon farming approaches capture a lot, some, or just a little bit more carbon than other standard approaches? Basically, how does this compare to other sequestration? I think I would just quickly chime in to say that the, um, you know, the carb scoping plan has just been released and it looks at nature-based solutions and carbon farming and tries to kind of quantify what we know about uh, agricultural systems across the state and their capacity for carbon capture and, and or carbon storage. Um, so that would be a good resource. Um, and I would just uh, again sort of reiterate that you just have all, all variations really depend on the percent carbon in the soil as to whether these are huge emitters or small emitters, have huge capacity for storage or, or relatively slow capacity for storage. But um, I think the scoping plan does a pretty good job of trying to kind of lay that out. Okay, and I know Jennifer Wood um, provided a comment in there as well about the effectiveness of carbon farming um, in comparison with other practices. Anyone else have any comments on the effectiveness of carbon farming? We have a, another good question here from, from Tina Reynolds with Uptown Studios, who unfortunately had to leave. Um, but Tina is asking, and I think this was directed at Campbell, but you know, I think you, you talked about wetting the land, basically being the strategy. Um, Tina's asking, how is how does the drought like? How is that impacted by the drought? <laughs> yeah, 
Well, I think uh, I think the interesting to note there is that uh, you know, these lands that I'm talking about are 20 to 30 feet below sea level, and sort of what you can envision being at the bottom of the drain, right? They are at the bottom of the bathtub, right next to the the drain, uh, and so there's there's actually a lot of energy that is expended on these deeply subsided islands to pump water off the island because water naturally seeps in um, around the levees, under the levees, and through the levees, and so. Um, so there's always going to be water in this part of the delta, even in the worst drought. Uh, optically, it's it's not a great time to be talking about uh, applying water to land or, uh, you know, in wetlands and or uh, for rice cultivation. But I think it's also important to understand that uh, if you look at the evapotranspiration rate of rice compared to some of the other commodities that are grown in the delta, it's not really dissimilar. The plants are still utilizing the same amount of water. Uh, wetland plants and rice as some of the you know, other commodities, corn and alfalfa and uh, pasture. You are applying more water, but you're also getting some protection from evaporation through just a, a kind of a uniform cover of wetland cover. So it's, it's, you would, there's always water in this part of the delta and you would not expect a significant increase in applied water or evapotranspiration from these practices. Any other comments on um, that topic, sort of the, just the drought issue? I guess Jeffrey. I'll chime. I guess I'll chime in because yeah, I think that our la natural lands have a great capacity to help us. What we almost can call spongify the landscape if we can restore riparian areas, if we can build organic matter. Um, to, to, to hold, to, to absorb more water when it comes and hold more water in a living um, soil that, that where the organic matter is, is maximized and you have a living root and you have a vibrant soil microbial community. And um, so I think that, yeah, we should absolutely be doing as much as we can to capture and store more water on the landscape. and um, keep our riparian area and expand if we can, uh, our riparian areas. And that just helps with resilience all around, um, around our farms and ranches and cities, parks. It's all, um, you know, I think we should be looking to maximize the capacity of the land and the soil to help us um, with our resilience, um, shade, heat, water. And as I pointed out in the um, in the chat, I just a little bit of a caution on our optimism for how many much we can offset our emissions with. I think we should look deeply into the numbers because there is a question about how much we can offset. We can definite there. I think that there's a consensus among soil scientists that you can offset current agricultural emissions with optimizing um, practices on, on, on certainly on working lands. Um, but I think the jury's out on how much more we can get, uh, how much more we can continue to emit because we're, you know, building up the soil organic matter and sequestering carbon in the soil. I just think it's a bit of an open question and it should be very carefully, um, you know, we should be really careful before we use it beyond its capabilities. Yeah, well, and, and we have Judy Nottley with us from CARB, and I know this might not be your, your area of expertise, Judy, uh, but, but Judy put in the chat the, the link to the scoping plan information. And I'm wondering if anyone on this call knows, so maybe a question for Jennifer, is what's in the scoping plan, the way that it talks about the effectiveness of carbon farming, is that, what you you recommend digging in deeper? Do you think that's something to look at, or do you think, or do you agree with the scoping plans assessment? I guess. I guess I haven't had a chance to look at it, so I want to look at that. I did put another um, link. Um, the Carbon Cycle Institute is really big into this. Um, they might be people. They're they're definitely huge proponents of of carbon farming, and they're really working on developing tools for counties to do uh, county level and regional 
carbon farm plans. So that might be something to look into. Um, I did invite Austin Miller from the Slough House RCD and I've been talking to him and he's kind of interested in um, maybe, you know, collaborating with folks to see what um, can be done for Sacramento County. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I, I would like, I want to dig into that and I put another, um, another resource from the Climate Center and Carbon Cycle Institute that looks at magnitudes of, of you know, carbon sequestration rates. Yeah, thank you for that. We have another good question and, and feel free, other, other people on this call, feel free to, to, you know, unmute yourself if you have comments on what we're talking about. Um, but Richard Falcone with United Latinos has a good question about workforce. And I see Rick Larkey's joined us, so I know he's interested in workforce stuff. Um, but really, okay, how does the, what's the workforce development aspect of this whole carbon farming conversation? You know, and his question specifically is, how do the methods being talked about here impact those workers that are vital to workforce development? And I'm curious if anyone has kind of familiarized themselves with the workforce component of, of this carbon farming concept. I might need a little bit of clarification. The workforce for me, uh, referring to ag workers? Yes, I think that's where Richard's coming from, yeah. I don't have a good answer. I'm just trying to understand the question. Yeah. <laughs> hey? With respect to some of the on-farm practices, for example, the riparian restoration or the hedgerow development, that would provide shade, um, some shade for breaks. Um, I'm not sure that it, that any, any of the uh, NRCS practices that, that are considered carbon farm practices would um, put any added risk and might reduce risk. If there's less chemical, less synthetic fertilizers being used and more soil amendments, that's potentially better for the lungs, as long as the soil amendments are applied properly, um, better for farm worker health. So, so I'm not sure, um, I, we have definitely not looked into that. Um, we are trying to outreach and, and um, two farms that are owned by, by POC, uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, and people of color, um, as part of our outreach, we're trying to connect with those types of farmers um, who are not traditionally the clients of the RCD or people that are asking for technical assistance. Um, but with respect to the workers, I, I don't see negative impacts from the, the um, soil farm, the farm, the carbon farming. Thank you. Jennifer? I think there's an opportunity to do some workforce development and training folks in like riparian restoration and maybe us, any upland work that can be done if uh, maybe that wouldn't be so much the case here in Sacramento County, but with tree thinning um, in areas that need it, that's for sure a huge work workforce and it, regionally in, in California, we need a lot of people who can do forest restoration. Um, but there's also a need, I think in farm, in farm communities, there's been talk at least in the San Joaquin Valley of needing more people to um, learn how to do the things like cover crop seed application. Um, there's like an equipment shortage, but if there was equipment, um, basically being like custom application for compost, um, cover crop seeds, and maybe Kate, you can think of some more things, but I've talked to folks in the San Joaquin Valley that think there could be, you know, community college or other kind of workforce development programs to train people up and possibly create an industry really um, because some of these, farming techniques aren't widely used right now and farmers are gonna need technical assistance and um, resources um, to adopt some of these things. 
irrigation management, that kind of thing. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, you know, I just, in relation to Richard's question, um, you know, I think that, you know, changes in agricultural practices um, in general should be uh, subjected to some sort of analysis of what's going to be the effect on workers, whether it's the amount of work or there's increased or decreased risk uh, for, in, in whatever way. Uh, that's something that actually doesn't seem to apply just in switching from one, one crop to another. But I do, I do think that if uh, that proponents of, of carbon farming should start including that analysis because things that are detrimental to the workforce probably should be planned for and addressed and not just sort of glossed over of, of oh, well, that, that's not part of the analysis that we need to do. But I, I, I don't think that just, just this type of change should be the only place where uh, carbon, um, where uh, workforce impacts should be analyzed. I think that needs to be something that's adopted throughout uh, um, throughout agriculture. Um, so. And I would imagine actually, uh, not that I'm an expert on, on agriculture, but if you switch from some sort of vegetable crop or something, some sort of crop in the Delta or anywhere, anywhere where you're doing carbon farming and it makes it so that there, it just needs fewer workers. So like if you went from farming to a managed wetland, that would almost certainly uh, displace, uh, displace workers. So anyway, is that sort of thing that needs to be thought of more systematically and more, more consistently? Yeah. I'll just quickly respond, um, yeah, Dave, I couldn't agree more. I think you're, you're spot on. Um, you know, I think uh, just in the Delta for, for managed wetland, um, you know, we're really targeting those lands that are already too wet to farm. And, and what that means in the Delta is that big tractors are actually, you know, fall, you know sinking into the ground and um, you can't keep those lands dry enough to farm because they're so deeply subsided. And then I think, Rice in the Delta is, is a highly mechanized operation, but at, so are most of the other operations, particularly corn in the Delta, um, which is a, a huge area. So, but I do think, nonetheless, I think your point is very well taken and those issues absolutely should be addressed and, and thought through. Yeah, thank you. Rick, did you have, also have a workforce related uh, question? Oh, just, I mean, from, my perspective, you've got three different, you got ag, you got natural resources, and you've got landscaping that are kind of involved in this. Each of, each of those groups have rather robust training networks, whether you're talking about retraining and upskilling of the existing workforce or new entrants. So the real question is, you know, to what degree do you want to involve them or to what degree do you want to be involved in their efforts to upgrade their curriculums and, you know, work with the existing employers in the various sections. So I'd be more than happy to facilitate that conversation if you want. That's an offer we might take you up on. Appreciate it. Humberto. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, yeah, the workforce question is kind of an interesting one. I think that, um, yeah, any any change to cropping system is going to require some some learning. But from anybody that's going to be doing that change, but I do think that there is already a shortage in labor, especially for ag, and so um, <clears throat> you know I think that particularly growers at this point are trying to maintain. Uh, the employees that they have year round to be able to have that workforce when they have those high demand um, uh, times. Uh, so, I mean, I don't, I think that definitely retraining would be something that you'd need to think about if you're gonna be switching or 
needing to have specialized type of uh, practices for to promote carbon farming. But uh, I mean, as far as impacts to them, I don't know that you're going to see. I mean, farming already has a hard time attracting the workforce, so I don't know that that you're really going to be displacing people because uh, I think that if any any farm operation that has workers are going to try to keep them because they're so hard to get farm work employees. So I don't know about the displacement issue. Thank you. And I'm looking at Grace Coffin, my colleague. I, isn't the average age of a farmer, in, at least in the Sacramento region, like 60, 59? I believe it's 56. 56. Um, so, yeah, that's a huge challenge, too, because, um, you know, oftentimes the next generation doesn't necessarily want to take over the land. And so that land could get sold, too, which also limits our ability to do any kind of uh, carbon capture on that soil. Wow. Dave, did you have a comment? All right, meet me then. Hey, Jennifer, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I guess I thought I would put a bug in people's ear. I know there's a builder, um, somebody from the builder group um, here, the idea of Built green infrastructure around new buildings and ways to build um, new construction or when you're retrofitting or infill, the idea of net zero building, um, you know, maybe instead of looking for offsets out um, offsite, but to consider how, and, and that would be a huge workforce development opportunity, I would think, and a wonderful, um, project for us locally to see if we're going to do new buildings. Certainly, let's see how we can uh, do on-site capture of water and um, carbon through green roofs and, and permeable pavement and things like that. So that would be a, um, a beautiful thing to see, I think. Yeah. Let's go to Todd next, and then I want to get to Majdi's question in chat. I was just going to add on to what Jennifer was speaking about. The, the county's climate action plan does include a number of those, um, I'll say, on-site type measures, not just carbon farming, even though that's what we're talking about today. Um, it does speak to things like green roofs and um, uh, kind of the green infrastructure on-site. Um, we're actually engaged in a process with the city of Sacramento to look at gray water reuse um, as one of those Kind of in the weeds type of, of measures as to the built environment. Um, I think we are generally in agreement here at the county that you know new projects, new development should seek to um, do all that it can on site uh, to reduce the emissions where the projects occur in those communities. Um, obviously the state you know building code requirements are, are becoming more and more stringent over time. And uh, we know that the development community, residential or commercial, what have you, has to comply with those requirements um, at the time they um, uh, seek building permits. Um, ultimately, uh, depending on an individual jurisdiction's goal, you know, uh, Sacramento County has a very aggressive goal, carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, that may eventually uh, lead to the need to have some sort of off-site uh, mechanism to get those those reductions that are needed because uh, there's a limited capacity to what can be achieved um, on site even if we meet all of our infill objectives and have the greenest development projects uh, that are not necessarily specified as infill um, it's just this is, to me this is one other mechanism that um, goes above and beyond those on-site measures but definitely agree with what you're saying Jennifer thanks Todd um, so I want to get to Maji's question, and Maji, I, I might actually ask you first. Uh, so your question is, and I think it's mainly for Campbell, um, but hey, are there any plans for utilizing shade via aggregate voltaics to reduce evaporation? Could you first tell us what aggregate voltaics are one more time? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, so agri-voltaics is, is a new developing technology, uh, also still searching for a uh, a concise definition, but 
the general idea is basically optimizing the land resources in a sustainable way for efficient uh, food and energy cogeneration. So the idea is to look at the land as a, uh, a pool of available resources. And for the first time, we're looking at solar radiation as a resource rather than a boundary condition. So in classic uh, uh, plant science or soil physics, we always calculate evapotranspiration based on how much incoming solar radiation is there. And uh, we put it in our models and we get how much water is needed for you know, uh, our plants to, to thrive and provide the yields that we want. Uh, the agrivoltaic technology takes this and completely transform the, the narrative. We look at solar radiation as a resource. So instead of looking at this entire amount of sun coming into the land and, and thus requiring a massive amount of water, uh, which many of the plants don't really need at all to produce the yields we want them to produce, why not cover part of the land with solar panels this will create shades and will generate actually uh, what, what we call a secondary crop, which is kilowatt hours, which growers can either use internally in their farms or uh, sell through power purchase agreements uh, and, and get additional income from it and also generate clear carbon. So agrivoltaics basically is uh, practicing agriculture under elevated solar panels or shades uh, that provide multiple circular benefits. So first creating green energy, but also providing shade that would reduce the amount of solar radiation and with that reduce the evaporative demand and the amount of uh, water that the plants below it require for uh, sustaining life and, and creating their crops. Thank you for that definition. I think I've seen my fair share of sci-fi book covers with <laughs> with that concept. <laughs> uh, Campbell, do you think, kind of to Maji's point, do you think that's something that could be done in the Delta? Well, yeah, I certainly don't know of any projects that are doing that, um, but it does seem like a huge potential. I mean, there are obviously shade tolerant species out there that we grow um, that could, you know, um, accomplish a lot of this, and I think it's a great idea. I really, though, I'm not aware of any any projects that are being um, contemplated in that regard. But that, but uh, sorry, don't don't take that as uh, as the authority either. I, you know, there's a lot of a lot that goes on in the Delta that I don't know about. So, um, so going back to the chat again, please enter your questions uh, or raise your hand. Hands get preference if you haven't noticed. Um, so Chris Norum, the, the builder, who he, he did have to leave, but uh, we still have Rick on, don't we? Um, so he's asking, will we need more water to do effective carbon farming in our region? And that's a good question. I would assume yes, but I want to hear from the experts. <laughs> So, sorry, just I, I might have not heard the question clearly. Will we need more water to do carbon farming effectively? Yeah, in our region, yeah. In our region. I mean, I guess the only thing I would say is that, you know, there's a lot of variety out there in terms of what can be done. I think as Jennifer and others have said, you know, there's, there's real capacity for carbon capture farming to actually help enhance the sort of sponge effect of, of the lands and how they retain water and, um, you know, don't evaporate water as quickly. Uh, in the Delta um, on the type of things that we're talking about, um, an increase of water, a marginal increase of water is probably likely to achieve what we're trying to achieve in the Delta. Great. So I see uh, John Lane's hand is up. John. Hi there, sorry, I had to get off mute. Um, uh, you know, one question I had, we've, we've certainly been talking about a lot of different things that we could rely on for, for carbon sequestration, but the, the county's climate action plan, if I recall, I don't have it right in front of me, relies pretty heavily on, on, on the carbon farming, which is why we're having this discussion. Um, Todd, do, can you talk to what were the various techniques or other things that the county's consultant relied on is there a is there a document or an appendices somewhere that I can't find that kind of talks to all the various things and how you came up with the number you came up with 
Very good question. Todd, his, his uh, video's off. He might have stepped away, John, but we'll make sure when he comes back to make sure that question gets asked. I feel really bad now. Now, now I put him on the spot and he's not there. No worries. Hey, there he is. Hey, Todd, did you hear that question? I did not. I just had to step out for a minute. Sorry about that. John, would you mind repeating or do you want me to attempt? No, I, I can summarize it. Uh, so, uh, Todd's John Lane. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot of different things that, that the county could have relied on. And but the carbon farming is probably, if I recall, I don't know the number in front of me is is probably the largest. Is that is that fair of, of the various techniques? Yes, that, yes, it is. So what are in, in what we've been hearing today, there's different ways to 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 do carbon farming, um, wetting the land and other things. Do you know what ascent used for the various assumptions to come up with your number? And is there an appendices that you can direct us to so we can kind of look into the, the nuts and bolts of that? Yeah. Um, I'm looking at it now. So appendix E of the county's climate action plan has all of the quantification uh, methodology associated with the inventory of emissions in the various sectors, the forecast, uh, the projected 2030 um, emissions, and then for each measure that's quantified in the climate action plan, um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction measure that's quantified, the assumptions that were used uh, for the numbers that are shown in the cap itself. So let me get there real quick. Um, Maybe measure GHG1, which is the carbon farming measure in the cap, it assumes there's, there's a variety of, of um, activities and it's applying various practices. So decreasing fallow frequency, adding perennial crops, intensive till, changing that to no-till or strip till as, as examples, compost is one of those. Anyway, um, on a total of 81,381 acres of cropland, um, and there's a whole bunch of numbers depending on which um, um, agricultural practice we're talking about, but it's all in Appendix E starting on page E8 for the carbon farming measure. And then did, do you know, did Ascent, how did they come up with those assumptions? Did they talk to farmers or the Farm Bureau or others to, uh, to really educate themselves on those assumptions or, or, or yeah. is that report? So for those who've been really closely tracking this particular measure, uh, the initial drafts of the Climate Action Plan had a, a much higher number. Um, and through conversations with um, the Ag county's agricultural advisory committee through conversations with the farm bureau uh, and then individual conversations with certain landowners uh, major landowners in the, the sacramento county we looked at or ascent looked at um, the feasibility of some of these practices on the actual land in the county unincorporated ca county ag lands and what has been done elsewhere in the region um, so we're trying to first started out at a theoretical level and then refine that to um, reflect what we think is realistic based on those conversations that we've had through the various caps. And then was the thought that if we adopt those numbers that the county would take a lead in kind of getting the farmers in line to, to meet those assumptions or was it a feel that, that the, the farmers would fall in line all on their own because of the benefits? Um, it, it's a combination of both. So this is one that is, um, obviously there's a number, a metric associated with it, it's quantified, uh, but it does take a lot of engagement, some education, uh, a lot of resources as, as others have mentioned. Um, and ultimately it does rely on um, the landowners, the farmers uh, actually changing practices. And so to the extent that that is successful, then that's a good thing. Uh, and obviously if it's not successful, then we have to figure out another way of either uh, increasing the um, education component or, or trying to change the hearts and minds of farmers, which is not an easy thing. Um, I know that. 
uh, or looking at other measures, uh, something you know we're always going to be having to do as we go through implementation in our annual uh, reporting mechanisms. Yeah, that's a great question, John, and appreciate Todd your response. And we'll we'll check out that appendix. That sounds like good good reading. <laughs> so, and we'll we'll sh uh, share a link to that in the call. John, that'd be, that's a, that's a tough one to find. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily we have the wonderful Kathy Seichu with us now, Valley Mission, who helps me with all these sorts of things. So, <laughs> um, but but thanks, Todd, for that uh, response. And and again, we, we still have stuff in the chat, so continue to um, add your questions. Just want to point out Shelly uh, Shelly Jung's comment here, uh, agreeing with Jennifer. There there. There would also have to be strong guarantees for the carbon farmed land to remain in ag production or conservation to avoid practices that would lead to reversals or releases of that carbon, right? So there has to be that long-term component, that long-term promise uh, to, to this. Um, so just making note of that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that statement. And I think Ralph, somewhere down in the bottom of the chat has a follow-up, maybe it's just asking me my opinion on that. I, I think that's a good idea. You know, if I want to use a parallel um, example, thinking about biological resources mitigation, that usually comes with, you know, a conservation easement. So I know um, ag uh, conservancies have a similar mechanism, uh, an ag conservation easement, or, or um, even another mechanism, although probably less uh, optimal, at least from a long-term perspective, is the Williamson Act um, uh, subvention agreement. So I think there's a variety of mechanisms, but I do agree that um, if we're going to have a willing property owner who is going to uh, engage in these practices, then we would want uh, to encourage them to get in under a conservation easement. Uh, that's what we did on, uh, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this, uh, when we got a South grant, we the property owner there was willing to engage in certain land management activities that um, were beneficial from a from a climate uh, greenhouse gas production potential on grazing land uh, and also increasing some uh, parts of the property, some riparian uh, habitat. But that property owner was willing to enter into a conservation agreement to make sure that that land remained uh, in its state and, and implementing those practices in perpetuity. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Campbell. Yeah, I just want to chime in on this a little bit too. It, it, this is definitely one of the biggest challenges for you know what we're trying to see. The American Carbon Registry Protocol that we have doesn't require a permanent easement, but it does require a 40-year permanence requirement within the contract to sell that carbon. So when you try to convince a farmer in the Delta that he's going to have to farm uh, rice for the next 40 years, that's nearly impossible to do. And it just makes sense. They're not going to make that kind of commitment. But it also kind of underscores the, the challenge just with the, the structure, the governance structure that we have. Um, you know, in the Delta, we're, we're talking about an avoided emission. If you want avoid that emission for one year, you have avoided that emission for one year, and that's what you're getting paid for. There is no way, essentially, to reverse that avoided emission that, you know, was avoided for that one year period. But nonetheless, uh, is the protocol still requires that requirement. So we're looking at ways to, that uh, investors can come in and shoulder that responsibility for the permanence requirement. Are there other ways that you can take that burden off the farmer themselves, but put it on to those that are purchasing the carbon that have sufficient buffer pools and whatnot to offset in the event of uh, you know, change in practices that uh, would not continue to avoid those emissions? That may be confusing, but that's the way it is. Thank you for that. Uh, John, John Lane. This is a really great conversation. And, and you know, it's what's interesting, I think, is, is, is how many acres that, I don't, again, I don't have it in front of me, but the, I just so many acres that we're going to rely on. It may actually be that we need to find a way both for just pure incentives to where, it, to where the farmer, it makes sense to the farmer and he does it, not necessarily under some form of contractor easement and then others in which we find a way to, you know, bring farmers to something that may be a little bit more permanent. But with that many acres, I think we're going to have to look at all everything that's on the table and, and, and don't rule out incentives. That would be my suggestion. Uh, 
Um, so just want to point out, Ralph, I, I know we're, I'm a little higher than, than where the chat is now, but pointing out about, you know, nitrate fertilizers being something to be, to be mindful of, uh, and, and also potent GHG, at least nitrous oxide. Um, Jennifer pointing out that, you know, I think in response to Chris Norum's comment about water, uh, Jennifer's saying that carbon farming, I, I think maybe Jennifer, you're arguing that you don't necessarily need a bunch more water, you just need to use what we have more efficiently. Right, so uh, that being a key component of carbon farming here, um, and you say working with existing water availability to capture it more effectively, extend spring moisture, and to better irrigate uh, or more efficiently irrigate. So that's a great comment. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Mark Lautzenheiser with Sac Metro Air District has a good comment or question about the photo, and maybe this is a question for Majdi, but the the uh, what the photovoltaics that you're talking about. How does that play around with um, farm equipment, and does it get potentially get in the way of farm equipment? That, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the, the agrivoltaic. I mean, there are a set of questions that we ask any farmers who are interested in uh, in this technology, and uh, so it is tailored to to basically every farm, and every farm is different. And the very first things that we look for is what type of equipment the growers have and uh, the basic two design parameters are what is the span width and what is the highest height that is needed so we look for a wide range of uh, all the equipments that those growers use and then we decide on what would be the design height uh, of course this will undergo some socioeconomics we see the feasibility what would be the return on investment uh, and what crops are going to be uh, planted under that, and and then we can we can shape our recommendation whether to move forward or not with with something like that. I hope that answered your question. Mark, does that answer your question? <laughs> Good. Other questions? No, oh, Shelley, that's cool. Company called. Do you want to unmute yourself and explain a little bit more about what this is? Yeah, um, I learned about them on another webinar series um, that was hosted by the San Luis Obispo Air District. I'll send a link to that. They had a lot of good information on carbon storage and carbon farming as well. But um, it seems like Nori is a um, company that basically uses blockchain technology and um, which I don't know really what blockchain is. Please don't ask me. <laughs> um, but, but basically they work directly with farmers in a way that I think um, sort of acknowledges farmers' needs and farmer farmer expertise to um, basically generate carbon offsets for um, carbon farming practices on their lands. And, and the um, blockchain is supposed to be part of that in a way to, to ensure that the credits are real and additional. And, and they also have sort of, um, I think, a 10-year contract process that tries to ensure um, permanence. Um, uh, let me find the link to the other webinar series where there was a speaker directly from Nori that explained their um, setup. Very cool. Yeah, and Jennifer offered offered her thoughts on the need for additional incentives <laughs> beyond what Nori is able to offer. So, um, thanks for sharing that, Shelley. Uh, Rick, you have your hand raised. Yeah, this is a simple question, but is methane capture and regeneration a part of this initiative? And if not, what kind of relationship is this initiative to addressing the methane issue? Well, I, I've, I've always heard methane is very bad uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> our climate. I'm um, looking at Jennifer, uh, what's, what's your take on the methane, is methane part of this carbon farming concept? Or is it addressed via carbon farming? If you're talking about methane from animal agriculture, maybe? Absolutely. And talking about, you know, the regeneration, energy regeneration approach. From manure? Recycling, using manure. precisely. Yeah, I mean, manure management 
is part of it, you know, composting, I guess, um, that can create a little bit of methane. Um, but manure management should always be, if you have a confined animal, uh, operation kind of like dairies, you know, the, all of that should be monitored and managed appropriately to minimize methane from the manure management, um, from the animals themselves, you know, that's kind of a big conversation. Um, of course, with mainly cows, right? Or ruminants, I suppose. Um, and there's arguments that grass-fed animals, you know, is, is maybe not as much of a concern, um, but, it's part of a whole when you do it when you, when you do a carbon farm plan you look at the whole entire operation including i think somebody mentioned you know like really a life cycle uh, when, when you're importing um it's really a whole, you use a greenhouse gas calculator like a comet farm a tool to look at the whole entire carbon cycle of your entire farm whether it's the fuels that you use in your operation or what you have to use to export things and um, so it's a whole farm approach. The techniques, you know, you're, you're looking to offset all of your operations basically in whatever way you can. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, Ralph, for that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? I guess I'm curious, uh, we, have, we have a couple of folks from ECOS who've been, who've been pretty restrained. <laughs> Um, Susan and Ralph, uh, do you guys have a, I mean, what's been ECOS's engagement with carbon farming? You have a position on it. Um, clearly you have an interest. <laughs> well, I can, I can speak to you a little. Uh, uh, well, I, I uh, grew up in New York City, so what do I know? But uh, uh, I, you know, I, it, it's a very interesting area. There, there is a lot of potential there, uh, but there's a lot of unknown also. And I'm uh, particularly concerned about the Permanence issue of the offsets, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I do think it's important also to uh, uh, let farmers know about what can be done. But then, how do we make sure that these things continue to happen? I mean, there's been a lot of problems talking about, uh, you know, forests, the offsets for forests, and then they go up in smoke. Uh, so uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's an area with some promise, but with a lot of questions. So. Uh, ECOS hasn't taken any formal position on it. The only thing I would add, Adrian, is that I think the there is a, an increasing need for conservation of land and conservancy action in this region. And I think we're beginning to look at that more and more. And also we're very aware of the California's 30 by 30 uh, initiative. And so I think conserving land, preserving land, buying land is um, buying easements. It's all very much on our mind. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Lane, your hand is up. I guess I had a question for Todd and the group, ECOS and others to consider is, you know, we're talking about offsets. Uh, there's been several re references to offsets and I totally agree if, if you're gonna rely on an offset, it needs to be real verifiable and permanent similar to any other mitigation measure. But here's the question for Todd, for the climate action plan, do, does the, the emission reductions that you rely on, are they required to be offsets or, or are we just looking for changes that create a net benefit that ultimately adds up to something close to the, the total numbers. Um, do they, so, cause if it's all offsets, then I totally agree. But if it's something that's a combination of the two, if somebody's gonna rely on those offsets to increase their emissions for something else, then it doesn't, it has to follow normal rules. But if it's just, we're trying to get to a number, wouldn't we all agree that, that, it, that they don't all have to, be permanent and verifiable, they just need to be there. And I, I leave that open to the group. It's an open question. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond, John, that's a, that's a good question. And it's probably important, well, it's, 
definitely important to clarify how it's characterized in the Climate Action Plan. Uh, the way it's structured uh, in, in the draft cap is that this is a standalone measure uh, where I think it, the second part of what you were describing uh, is applicable where it's, it's we're looking to get these types of practices changed uh, and based on the acreage that we assumed and the associated greenhouse gas emissions reductions. It is not explicitly characterized as an offset uh, for other projects, although there is an opportunity to have that conversation on a project by project basis. And that is where absolutely I agree if, if an applicant of uh, a development project through uh, the consistency checklist or consistency analysis process uh, is, is defining what implementation measures of the climate action plan or, or greenhouse gas reduction measures of the climate action plan it can do. Um, obviously, a number of these are specifically associated with new development. Um, there's going to be some limit to uh, what can be implemented. Then we get into offsets after all the on-site mitigation or reduction measures are applied. And that would, in my mind, that would definitely trigger uh, the conversation and, and the, um, the permanence aspect of it um, in order to comply with uh, what we know the state requires from a regulatory perspective, that, that permanency of the offset. Thanks, Todd. Do others have thoughts on, on the offset? issue. Okay. Well, we're coming up on time. We have about five minutes left. Um, I'd love to hear from our remaining, I know uh, uh, one or two folks had to jump, but love to hear from our remaining experts, the folks we initially invited, just with any closing comments. And I'm actually looking at Umberto uh, to go first, uh, just any sort of takeaways, uh, maybe next steps for Yolo County, like what's what, what's Yolo County going to be doing in the near future? With this? Well, um, I think like uh, it was mentioned uh, that we are kind of moving forward with some just pilot projects to try to see what what this looks like and, and try to promote it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Somebody mentioned incentives. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, uh, but they have to be meaningful, um, you know, to be able to really make it worthwhile. And uh, uh, growers are sometimes a hard group to introduce change into, but I think that they're also looking for, um, you know, ways to uh, improve the land, to leave the land better than they found it. I think that, uh, you know, they're, they are, they do value the land and see it as having um, value beyond the ability to produce uh, a crop for them and, 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 and produce uh, econo economic income for them. So I, I think it's definitely an important thing to, to promote. I think the photovoltaic farming is an interesting thing that I know we're, we're discussing internally, how do you promote, uh, uh, I mean, growers want to promote clean energy or the county wants to promote clean energy. And sometimes that clean energy uh, is best developed or, or the, the, the photovoltaic operations are better set in farming operation or in land that's prime ag land. So then you have this competing issue where you're trying to create uh, um, clean energy, but then you're taking away prime farmland that is going to be maybe taken out of production and the, co the concept of that that uh, uh, affordable takes that allow farming to continue, I think is something that is definitely something that we need to really move forward on and and, and promote. Yeah. Well, Majdi, <laughs> why don't you go next since that's highly relevant to what you're talking about. Thank you, Adrian. I, yeah, I would like to build on what Umberto started uh, and uh, maybe leave with a few uh, points. Uh, I'd like to touch on the timeline for climate smart solutions. Uh, I think Jennifer and maybe Todd also mentioned a tool called Comet Farm. Uh, so any anyone who wants to ask for carbon uh, credit, the Comet system is one of the 
systems or tools that are used for calculating uh, carbon. And it's based on, you know, a very meticulous system of life cycle and, and, and others. Uh, and uh, what I want to, to share is uh, the Comet system has only uh, a few alternatives and, uh, and, and uh, healthy soil initiatives that have been in the research world for the past five, six decades. Uh, so from cover cropping to compost applications to, to many others. Uh, if we really want to speed up the wheel, uh, I'll go also on to another point that Umberto mentioned and, and say that we really need to invest more on uh, research grade pilot uh, programs where we build many of those pilots of our new climate smart technologies and, and demonstrate to farmers, growers, and uh, uh, everyone about their utility and how much carbon they sequester. So these are the points that I want to leave with. The, the timeline is if we want to leave it with the classic type of let universities lead with the typical grant cycles and then take that to the next level and then the next level and then the next level. I don't think we can see agrivoltaics on in Comet uh, until 20 years from now. And I would love to see it before I retire. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope we can expedite the timeline with, with building more and more pilots. Thank you. Todd, any closing comments? Then we'll go to Kate last. Nothing for me. I appreciate the, uh, the conversation, different exchange of ideas. So much, Kate. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here and I'm coming away, I will just share, I thought this was a great discussion and brought up so many different points. Um, my three takeaways are um, to make sure that we consider changes of, in practices um, and their effects on, on workers, on agricultural workers, um, to promote the equity that we're looking at farming at, at the business side of the equity, but we need to also remember the, the um, farm workers. Um, also, again, uh, the agrivoltaics, very intriguing. I had no idea this was being done, and um, I'm going to take it to the Climate Action Committee and back to the office and see, you know, what propose it as something to look into. And then finally, what Majdi just brought up is um, we do a lot of work and we do monitor some of our work, but it would be great to look into partnering with researchers on some of our projects. And that's something that even the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts might be able to help out with because they are tied in with all of the RCDs around the state who are doing a lot of a lot of on-farm implementation work that is being monitored. And if we could get uh, researchers looking at that and maybe standardizing what we're doing, there may be opportunities to advance, advance the science um, much more. So those are my three takeaways. And again, thank you everyone. This was, this was great, I learned a lot. Thank you all. We are, we are at time, but just want to thank our wonderful experts who are able to join us. Uh, again, uh, the Clean Air Partnership is a, is a coalition, so we, we look forward to continuing to engage with you all, uh, continuing to learn more about local air quality topics in the Sacramento region. Um, this has been recorded, so we'll put it up on our YouTube, and we will uh, get an email out to you all with, with some notes and, and other links and things, So as well as folks' contact info if, they're, if, if they are okay with that. So. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day and thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody.